Hey, this is David Christian from The Modern Martial Artist, and today we got a bunch of stuff to talk about um, very quickly. So, first is that my breakdown of Triple G versus Canelo was removed due to a copyright content claim. And for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, it's basically where the company who owns the original footage or the original, original um, product says, you're using our thing in an illegal way. Uh, and of course I don't think I am. I think it's free use and, um, the reason it's free use is because for educational purposes, it's, um, I don't use an unedited clip that's over 20 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> I turn it really into its own individual content. And of course, um, it's the same thing with film critics who, who, you know, critique films. There are a bunch of those guys on YouTube and it's the same thing, uh, with sports writers, except it's just in a, in a visual format. So I think it's it's fair use, but I'm sure as hell not going to fight or even mention the name of the people who took it down because they are a billion-dollar corporation, and I am not. And uh, I really don't... In order to challenge them, that opens you up to a lawsuit. So if I say, I don't think this breakdown was violating the terms of copyright and I want to challenge you on this then they can turn around and sue me uh, with the guy who's making a thousand dollars an hour just just to kind of put it away very quickly and make a point and I can end up owing them lots of money which I do not want to do so that video's gone I, I wish I could put it up somewhere but I really can't um, just because I don't want to really fight them on it and put myself at risk like that someday Maybe someday, but uh, but as it stands, I, I don't have the legal power to do that right now. So it's a bummer. I hope you guys got to see it. It got a lot of views. Uh, I was really proud of it. It got a lot of watch time. It looks like most people watch the video all the way through, which I didn't think you guys... Like, I wasn't sure. I thought some of you guys might be interested enough to, to go step by step like that. Uh, to where, you know, I, I broke down an entire sequence a couple times. But I wasn't sure, and so I was happy that there were enough people interested in that. What I'm really curious about is I want to hear what you guys in the comments, I want to hear who you think would win the rematch. I have a friend who's pretty knowledgeable, kind of an, uh, he was a stuntman way back in the day, like 30 years ago, back when there wasn't as much safety precautions. He's a stuntman in Hollywood, highly athletic. He has a busted hip now, but he could still do um, like backflips on the trampoline and, and uh, all this kind of crazy stuff. He's been boxing forever. And in his opinion, Canelo 100% wins a rematch because he thinks that Triple G only knows one way to fight and Canelo can adjust. And I don't know about that. Triple G did adjust, but... He didn't really. He adjusted in by by kind of toning back what he was more than an actual adjustment. We didn't see anything new from him. We saw we saw something more reserved. Uh, he did a great job with fainting to back Canelo up. Um, he'd faint his right hand and then he'd throw those offer them jabs. Uh, but what you really saw was a lack in the beginning of those uh, of those curving shots that he likes to to throw and to kind of blindside you once he presses close. And we saw a lack of that because he got a, you know, he got uppercutted a, a good deal when he tried to do that to start. And then we saw more of that at the end um, after Canelo had kind of been worn down a little bit. But I think you know, I think he has kind of a valid point cuz I could see Canelo fighting differently the next time. The only way I could see Triple G fighting differently is if he's putting on more pressure if he's not as reserved which I think he's gonna definitely want to do <laughs> because he doesn't want to leave it to decision again uh, like I said in the video that got deleted I think he I think it was an insanely close fight insanely close but I think that Triple G edged it and not just because he was putting on more pressure but because he landed more shots overall and there are a lot of people saying that Canelo landed cleaner yeah I 100% agree Triple G did land some very clean shots but Canelo landed consistently cleaner shots. But that doesn't mean that the shots that didn't land as clean didn't count. I mean, whether or not a shot is clean really comes down to, did something get in the way of it first? Did it just kind of clip you instead of hitting you full on? And did your opponent roll with the punch? And I think in most instances, 
the problem with Triple G's punches was that Canelo was rolling with the punch. And if you look at it in slow motion, it really looks like Canelo didn't take very much damage at all because it's just the fist hits his face, but it's already moving back, and it just kind of disperses the impact. Uh, and that, the interesting thing about punches is that it really matters uh, something called the impulse. And the impulse is basically how much force is generated in a specific amount of time. So if there's more force in less time, then that's a that's way worse for your brain, basically. That shakes your head around, or that or that um, that breaks tissue, that breaks bones. You know, you, you want a very high short spike of an impulse. Something like a for for a punch, anyways, for a knockout punch. Something like a push kick is gonna have a longer impulse because you're transferring more of your body weight over a longer period of time, and you're trying to knock your opponent back to intimidate them for whatever reason. But what you can do to lengthen the impulse is to roll with the punches which canelo is awesome at and he as soon as the punch connects he's already moving back and then he'll he'll kind of accelerate it and that kind of split second reflex is is absolutely insane you know um very few fighters have it very few fighters a lot of fighters can roll with the punches but to just feel that little bit of of, of a touch on your face and then your head just just snaps back and it pulled back I could, I could think of three or four, uh, Muhammad Ali being one of them, to where they just feel anything and their head immediately goes boom. And then it's it, it follows the trajectory of the punch. You saw Mayweather do that a lot when he fought Conor McGregor. He'd get hit, but he'd roll with it so well, it's like the, the punch barely had any impact at all. But once again, that's in slow motion that you're seeing that. So if it looks like it's hitting at regular speed, and it looks like it's not having that much of an impact in slow motion you have to kind of realize that it's still a punch and it's still gonna hurt and they did take that first moment of impact even though even though they dispelled a lot of it by um by lengthening the time of the impact by lengthening how long it took for that force to kind of disperse it still will hurt <laughs> it still hurts you know and it still counts as a punch it's just not as clean a punch. Uh, so Canelo did definitely land better punches the entire night, but that doesn't dispel the fact that Triple G did land the punches that he landed. It definitely means that uh, that they didn't have the impact they normally do. A, a lot of people were asking, well, where is Triple G's power? Well, Canelo took it by rolling with by rolling with the punch. But anyways, I, I didn't mean to go off on that whole tangent. Uh, rematch, I think the only adjustment Triple G is going to make, he could make a couple others, actually. I could think of a couple. But I think the main one is he's going to put on more pressure more quickly. That's what it's going to be. I, I see a lot more head movement and a lot more pressure. And I think he's, he's going to go for it. Just just head on, just just charge, come in charging. Uh, Canelo, I could see, I don't even know right now. I would need to sit down and seriously think about it. I need to rewatch the fight a couple times and, and see what he could be looking at as, as potential weaknesses. But I could see him being able to adjust because he's able to fight both going forward and he's able to fight countering, uh, going you know going backwards. So so yeah, it, it is a more he is a more versatile versatile fighter in regards that he could do both. Um, I'll definitely give him that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I could definitely see him winning a rematch. But I could I could see Triple G taking some heavy shots since he's not so afraid of Canelo's power anymore. Because um, he took some heavy shots mid-round, uh, you know, in the middle rounds too, um, when Canelo still had a good deal of power. And I think Canelo still had a good deal of power in the later rounds too. So I don't know if Triple G is going to be as intimidated anymore. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. So, uh, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about uh, is I have a release date for the book for those of you that don't know i'm writing a book called power of the pros and it's about how the world's best boxers mma fighters kickboxers put power into their moves um and i wrote this book because although there's a ton of stuff for how to generate power in um like swinging a baseball bat or or throwing a pitch 
or golf. There, there's a bunch of books on how to generate power on that one. And I've, I've seen very few books on how to use the principles of physics and biomechanics to put power into your strikes. So I wanted to, to write a book on that, but I wanted to do it in, in, a, in a simplified, practical way. Because of those books, uh, it seems like the author is just trying to impress you with math equations. And the, they'll, they'll explain it through these mathematical equations, but they won't really explain what that means to you as someone who's a martial artist. So, I mean, everyone knows the basics, uh, like, you know, weight times speed. Okay, great. How do I increase the speed? How do I put more weight into the punch? They don't bother to tell you that. They just write out the entire equation. And like a 10 million different terms that really only matter in the world of physics and, and, and really equate to the same thing. So what I wanted to do was write a book that gave you techniques that you could specifically implement for whatever style you have and know 100% that if I do this at this time and I do it correctly, it will generate more power. And here are the upsides to this, and here are the downsides. And that's what I wanted to do. And then after I've explained that, I've wanted to show you how some of the best fighters in the world did this in their own specific way. Because to me, that's a, that's a big part of the art in martial arts, is not only how to set up your techniques and what kind of techniques you throw and what kind of fighter you are, but the individual strikes themselves. How do you generate power in them? How do you move? You know, um, the art of, uh, of human movement. Uh, and and uh, it's astounding how many different ways that these fighters have found to, to use the principles um, to put power into these strikes. And of course, a great deal of them just do it instinctually. It's just how they happen to naturally do this. They, they just practiced enough and they had a natural inclination and this is just how their body moved and this is just how they timed their strike and this is just what they felt was right. Uh, and of course you have different fighters um, doing different things. Uh, jo Joe Lewis uh, was different. Uh, Jack Dempsey was different. They spent a lot of time in their books breaking down into minute details why they punched the way they punched. But some, you know, and some, but some fighters just completely just hit bags and people <laughs> until they found what worked. Um, but all of them are worth exa uh, examining. Uh, so the the release date, <clears throat> excuse me, the release date, I have a cold. Uh, the release date is for tentatively the first. So in this upcoming month, October. So it will be the first of October. I'm going to release the text version of the book. Uh, I'm also going to have a lot of companion videos out for it, and and you can kind of reference it. You're going to get uh, a password, I think is how I'm going to do it, a password to um, a page on my website, and you can see all the video companion videos there. Um, but the text of the book will be available on the first for the people who pre-ordered it on half off. Uh, I'll leave a link below. You guys can still pre-order ha for half off um, until the first. Starting on the first, uh, the text will be available, and you'll be able to purchase that for $10.00. And then uh, when the videos are put out, that's when I'm going to charge the entire 15. And the videos uh, should just take a couple weeks. Um, I already have the scripts for them, obviously. I just need to edit it all together. But uh, yeah, I've been editing the, the final, uh, the rough draft of my book for a while on, on power generation. I just kept, I kept thinking of more things to add. Um, and as I kept thinking more things to add, my goal is not to have, just like my, my breakdowns, my goal is not to have as many words as possible. <laughs> my, my, goal, my goal is not to fill out this book. I want the book to be long enough to, to, ha to contain enough information to where you guys feel like, wow, this was a bargain. I got so much information and so many examples for my money. Um, you know, I, I feel like th this is something that's very valuable. But at the same time, I don't want you guys reading getting bored uh, because because losing interest and in needing to kind of trudge your way through things which is the same reason why I didn't put any mathematical equations in the book or anything like that and try to act all pompous and, and or whatever the heck um, if you want to get into that uh, a book that I constantly referenced is, is called biomechanics in sports it has all the mathematical equations it explains things very clearly unfortunately uh, I think it has a sentence on boxing 
Um, so I wanted to create a book that that was, you know, had all that information, but condensed down to where you didn't need to get a degree in physics to, to understand it <laughs> and then uh, and then be able to apply it into your strikes. So, yeah, that's it. It's on the on the first link is below if you want to uh, still buy it now for half off uh, or buy it on the first for, for only ten ten dollars. Um, and another thing is that I'd, I'd love your feedback on it. If you do buy it or you've already bought it, I would absolutely love to hear if anything was unclear, if you'd like more information in another place, any of that stuff. Um, I'd be very grateful if you emailed me back a response to it. All right, so I kind of want to uh, finish the podcast talking about something that's really kind of been ticking me off lately. And uh, there's been a name developed for it now for martial arts schools that, that just kind of set up among a certain path and their whole goal, um, like cookie cutter martial arts schools, their whole goal is to, is to get as much money from you as possible. They cater a lot to kids, which there's nothing wrong with it. I think that's fantastic. But they, the, the ones that do this cater a lot to kids. And uh, a term has arisen um, for them which I think is very apt, which is called McDojo. Uh, it, this is a cookie cutter martial arts school meant to drain as much money from you as possible. And that's not even my, my big problem with them. Is that My big problem is, them, is that they give people an unrealistic perspective on martial arts and then they make people feel that they're getting value when they're really not. Um, so... Let me, let me start with the first biggest problem. And this is a problem uh, I feel pertains mainly to putting kids in. Uh, if you, like I started when I was six um, at a martial arts school. And while it had certain elements of a McDojo, it still allowed p sparring at a very young age, uh, punches to the head, which but point sparring, all heavily padded, all heavily supervised. And that's a great introduction for a kid, I feel. Um, because uh, if anything, it teaches you to get used to moving in and out. It gets it gets you used to setting up strikes, even though you can't follow up with a combination, which was actually, as I turned into a teenager, kind of kind of hard for me. And and I still sometimes tend to just do you know strike and then get in and out, uh, rather than follow up enough, unfortunately. Um, but I've gotten much better at it as I've gotten older and and have you know gotten more serious and practiced more and more at it. But um, but it's a great introduction for kids. It's just you know heavily supervised, padded point sparring with with punches to the head and uh you know in other ways it, it did teach a lot of unrealistic principles unrealistic technique that kind of thing but my biggest problem with these mcdojos is that they claim they're teaching children respect responsibility and focus and maybe they used to but from what i've seen uh, they they no longer do and let me explain why your child at this point, if they go into a McDojo, is not being sat down and told they must sit quietly and listen while the instructor explains in a normal tone of voice how to do something. And the kid must focus on this, pay attention, and then focus during the drill and execute everything. That would be fantastic. That's how it used to be done. Now, if you are a martial arts instructor, you're pretty much being forced by the owners of the McDojos to be turned into a cartoon character. <laughs> In other words, it is your job to get the child to pay attention to you through entertainment value. And that's okay to a certain point. Kids are never going to have the focus of adults, especially the little kids. It's okay to talk and sing songy, you know, voice to the little kids. It's okay to make jokes. It's okay to do all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's not okay to need to scream at the top of your lungs, jump around like you're a Looney Tune, and, and then beg and plead with the child. And I've seen this happen. Um, and fortunately, I've never been asked to do this myself. Uh, but I've seen it happen to where, uh, because I, I did this when I was, when I was younger, um, I taught at the school that I grew up in and then I taught it at a couple other schools too, in different styles. And I, uh, you know, I teach kids as well as adults and, uh, man, it's, it's, it's like some of these schools, the, the instructors being paid not to competently teach martial arts, they're pay being paid to be a Looney Tune and, that's the preferred method to get the child's attention. 
And really, what should be happening is that the kid should be learning the crucial skill of focusing and what it means to respect people by keeping your eyes on them and listening to them. And I don't see that happening anymore. Um, and, and this even, this is a big problem with the drills they set up too. Because if they had the child focus and listen and pay attention to the technique, then and then perform that uh, like a line drill, go up to a bag, hit the bag, then they'd probably have a better idea how to, how to do that. But as it is, it's like they want to keep the, they want to do it as quickly as humanly possible. So it's like the instructor will line up the kids and then hold the pads. And the goal isn't for the kid to even hit as hard as they can or to, or to um, you know, do the technique as well as they can, regardless of the effectiveness of the technique. But they're not even paying attention to the traditional method of doing it uh, or correcting the kids at all. It's just the kid does a hammer fist, just bam, runs to the end of the line, does, does like a, you know, goes through a little maze, like an obstacle course thing, and then comes back, and then bam, and then does it again. And there's very little teaching being done. It's really just, kind of just like a summer camp. You know, it's, it's like you, you're taking your kid to, to a fun zone kind of a thing. Um, I encountered, you know, I encountered this recently. I, uh, I teach gymnastics too, and there was a martial arts school that wanted me to start a gymnastics program for them. And uh, it didn't end up working out because we, we couldn't come to, uh, well, they changed the terms of the agreement. I would have asked for a percentage of the program, but uh, I said, well, you know, how about I, I just can do private lessons, charge what I want to do and bring them where I want to bring them. And then um, I, I went there a couple weeks with, to see, kind of gauge how many times, how, uh, how many kids were interested. They got a bunch of kids that were about to sign up for the program. I was stoked, and then they changed the term of the agreements and said only they could schedule private lessons only at their place, and they wanted 50% of the profit. And I'm like, that's not worth my time. <laughs> you just cut what I could have potentially made to, to like a tenth or, or a fifteenth. Um, but that was a problem I noticed with their school. Uh, and I've noticed in a couple other schools when I have like, you know, friends with kids in the, in a program or, or other places. And it, I just feel like it's cheating out the parents out of money and it's cheating the kids out of what a real martial arts experience is. Um, now to rant about the actual, not even the techniques. I'm a big believer that almost any technique can work. If it's halfway competent, uh, you could at least modify it to work. But how how these schools train these techniques leave people just woefully unprepared for a fight, and if they ever get into a fight, they're gonna they're just gonna be shocked, massively shocked. I remember um, my first fight ever because I was dumb as a as a kid and I was dumb as a young adult and I got into a lot of a lot of fights. But my first fight really taught me the most because I was in middle school, uh, and I was attacked by this kid in a in a bathroom. Um, I think because he'd, lo he'd lost a game or something. I can't, rem I can't remember. But I went to do a very good front kick with extremely excellent form, and I lifted my knee and paused it there for a second <laughs> to, to really, you know, I guess charge the power. I don't know what I was thinking. And then, um, and then I went to kick him with my, you know, ball my foot pointed, and I, I, I don't remember if I key it or not. I don't even know. But the kid, my kid, the kid I was fighting just grabbed my leg and then threw me into a wall. And then we got into a scuffle. Um, somehow my shirt came off, uh, and I managed to, to throw him um, down onto the ground, which won me the fight. Because I, I think he hit kind of hard, uh, and it was like a bathroom tiled floor. Uh, which I don't think... You know, I'd, I'd uh, wrestled with my friends a lot or whatever, or like, you know, play fighting or whatever the heck, growing up a lot as a kid, because uh, my friends and I just like to beat up each other for some reason. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't think I'd ever been taught that technique. I was lucky at the school I grew up, we, we learned basic Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu, believe it or not. It was a Kempo blend school. So while it did have some questionable techniques, we also learned how to get someone off top of us and, and uh, you know, and, and the different guards, like half guard, mount, all that kind of thing. And, and you know, we were competent in that way. But as, as far as I can recall, uh, I'd only learned like a standing arm bar and hadn't really learned any, any throws um, that I can remember. So that was something I didn't even learn that, that, won me the f <laughs> that, that won me the fight. And that was probably just through sheer luck. I don't know. But um, so... The, the technique 
that's being utilized, the way it's taught is far worse. Because front snap kicks can be fine, especially if they're to the groin, honestly. <laughs> but front snap kicks can be highly effective, um, can be. But, but they require a certain amount of training in a realistic environment. Um, as, you know, uh, they can be used, it's been proven they can be used in the UFC. And they, they can win people really well. Uh, you know, in a real fight where you don't have all that space a lot of the time, or, or uh, you know, you don't have all that room, there are things in the way that the guy could have friends. You know, putting yourself off balance is never really a good idea, so so throwing a, a kick above waist level is kind of questionable, but it could still be done. I could, I could still see it being done, you know. Um, as, but ch- there's even footage on, on YouTube of a, of a cop using a chop to the neck to take a guy down. You know, anything can be done if it's trained correctly, but having the opponent just stand there while at, while you sloppily wave your arms around, just just like ha, 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 with doing fifty different moves in in five seconds, uh, is is not an effective way of of training anyone. Just how compliant the partners are taught to be. I mean, I understand at the very beginning of your training having a compliant partner because you just want to get a feel for the move. And you want to learn where everything is, and you want to learn how different people are different sizes, and uh, and and you know you want to learn spatial relationships, how far away certain things are from from certain other things, how long your arm your own arms are and and feet are and and elbows are, and you want to know you know how long your arm is because you want to know how far away you can hit someone basically, and you want an innate feeling of that. So to start off, compliant partner drills are are fine, but. Even with adult classes, a lot of these McDojos have just just very compliant drills. Another problem is there's there's lack of um, there's a lack of emphasis on fitness to to the extreme, um, to where you have black belts who can't properly execute a front kick um, to the knee, <laughs> even, and 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 that's a major problem. That's that's a huge problem. If you want to give someone a belt and they're not able to perform the moves. Um, regardless of what your feeling is uh, about belts at all, um, you know my opinion is it depends on the system. A Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt is like, oh wow, okay, yeah. But a karate black belt, um, depend it depends on the style. But a number of the styles uh, is highly dependent what school is from. Some schools could be like, okay, that's legitimate. That is a karate black belt from this lineage, and that guy, uh, you know, requires a high amount of physical fitness. He requires that you really know what you're doing, that you spar all the time, um, and there could be a karate black belt who who looks like a joke, just an absolute joke. Like like no one taught this guy. He maybe he tried, but they gave him a false sense of security, which is the worst thing you could do to to someone is give them a false sense of security and accomplishment, and then they work hard for something, and then when it finally, if they ever get into a real scenario. It's like, well, 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 damn! I, I spent you know a hundred fifty dollars a month, or or uh, you know two hundred fifty dollars a month for me and my kids to come to this place, and uh, and it was all bull, you know. Uh, I can't say the second word of that sentence because my video may get demonetized. Actually, I don't think I'm even monetizing this one. Yeah, I won't monetize this one. But that's funny. I can't say the second half of that sentence on YouTube anymore. I mean, give me a break. Um. So yeah, that's pretty much. That's pretty much all I wanted to go over that I had to say this week. Thank you for listening to me rant if you've made it this far. Uh, I will be announcing this again probably in the next video, but I've been considering deeply having another content creator for my channel. Uh, Someone who specializes in something. I I consider myself far, far more competent with striking than I do with grappling. So someone who's like a... um, who could break down grappling situations much better than I could would be awesome so that way and I'd like it to be weekly like one video a week and I'll put out a video a week uh, maybe someone who specializes in like fencing even or uh, or you know the stuff that's just very very um, like a minor portion of the population but at the same time it, it they're a specialist in it would be interesting uh, like Taekwondo um, Olympic Taekwondo wrestling judo uh, any any kind of uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, like tournaments and anyone who's interested in any of those specialty things and could do a great breakdown that I could, that they could make a breakdown and I could see that for myself um, and payment would either be a percentage of the ad revenue 
or probably much more valuable would be um, promoting your own product or website or Patreon is what I would suggest because that could make you a lot more potential money. But yeah, if you're interested, uh, just send me a message through YouTube and uh, or my email, which I have up on the about section. So yeah, that's it for this podcast. I hope you guys are having an awesome week and uh, hope to get that book out by the first. I'm 99.9% confident that I will. So check it out, left a link below. Uh, send me any info, send me a message and some uh, a link to some stuff you've done uh, if you're interested in uh, in being a part of the channel. And happy training.